This episode of Headlock Talk is brought to you by... Austin-based company Naturally Hemp's and their new line of CBD gummies. These gummies are made with 100% baked-in, pharmaceutical-grade, non-isolate-based CBD. What we're talking about here is the entourage effect. The entourage effect refers to the stronger effect you get when combining multiple cannabinoids together as opposed to just CBD. Full-spectrum CBD or CBD distillate tends to be more potent and last longer, which is what we're talking about here. Unlike some other brands that use a spray-on CBD, Naturally Hemp CBD distillate is baked in so you know you're getting the full dose with each gummy. I personally use them for all kinds of things like sleep aid or muscle pain. And did I mention they taste great? They got five flavors, uh, strawberry, green apple, lemon lime, watermelon, and get this, the orange flavor has vitamin C in it. Ooh. So if this sounds like something you could go for, head over to your nearest Creative Sig vape shop and pick yours up today to see for yourself the difference Naturally Hemp's gummies can make in your life. On this week's episode of Headlock Talk Presents Wrestling Lore, we're taking a look at one of wrestling's most historic and perhaps most influential wrestlers of all time. Yes, the eighth wonder of the world, Andre the Giant. Alrighty, what is up everybody? Welcome back to yet another episode of Headlock Talk. Uh, we are continuing our wrestling lore series here today. Wrestling lore here uh, with my good buddy and, and friend, longtime friend of the show, Mike Charlotte. Mike, how are you doing today? I am doing well, Tanner. Happy to be here. Awesome, man. Well, I'm happy you're here as well because we got a lot to get into and, um, you know, this episode in particular it's it's a little bit odd to me man i'll be honest with you because we're, we're going to be talking about a guy who's obviously like his impact on wrestling is um ginormous uh pun it's, intended, he, pun intended. <laughs> uh he has an, an enormous uh impact on on the wrestling business in general but we we hardly ever talked about him here on the show you know um uh-huh. So, um, uh, we of course are talking about uh, the one, the only, uh, the eighth wonder of the world, Andre the Giant. Um, Mike, when I say Andre the Giant, when, when I talk about Andre the Giant, or when anybody brings up Andre the Giant, I mean, what do you first think of? Well, essentially, he is the first giant of wrestling, like, literally. Mm. Like, you always, like, everybody... Everybody who's over seven feet tall or, or, you know, almost seven feet tall is compared to him. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, especially guys like like Big Show. I mean, when Big Show first came in, WCW said that he was his son. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, (laughs) that being a lie. But, uh, but yeah, like, he he was just... he, He made wrestling for giants, essentially. He is the reason why giants are so heavily uh touted in wrestling i guess Mm -hmm. there there wouldn't be a big show without under the giant yeah i mean there wouldn't be i mean you could look at big show you could even look at guys maybe even smaller type guys like um braun Strowman, for example who is uh, just an overall very large man (laughs) Uh-huh. Uh, you could look at, I mean, even guys that are just on the taller side, like your your Kevin Nash, for example, right? Like yeah. those kind of guys. Um, you know, obviously they he have basically a, revolutionized the style of those people. The big man wrestler, the Undertakers, yeah. the Canes, yeah. the yeah, and then uh, those people kind of made it their own. But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I and I mean, and and this is in no way intended to be. A, a slight towards Andre or his legacy or whatever, but there is, um, in my mind, because of what, when Andre came into the business around the, um, the mid sixties, uh, you know, that was kind of mm, wrestling was not like widely exposed on television and these kind of things. It was still very much a town to town territory kind of thing 
very even good. very not, much so. Yeah, I mean, not just even here, but like in Canada and France and you know just Europe in general. Um, it it kind of still had that that oddity aspect, that carnival aspect. Hey, come see Andre the Giant, right? And and mm-hmm. you would see him walk through the curtain, and it would be just just people stunned in amazement of how large he actually was. And that's kind of how he was treated throughout, like the early part of his career. He was an attraction he was that that was in in a sense like certain shows even if they were even if they weren't like primarily wrestling shows you Mm -hmm. went to see him because of how large he was i mean like he was over seven feet tall he was like seven three Mm -hmm. and that was something you didn't see back then yeah ever ever yeah. yeah very very much so um let, let, let's let's get into his life a little bit and we'll talk about his career uh andre Rene ruzimov was born obviously on uh 19 uh the 19th of may 1946 uh son of uh immigrants from uh bulgaria as well as poland um he he did have two other siblings um he it, it was noted uh, or rather reported, I'm not sure if this is exaggerated or not, that he weighed 13 pounds when he was born as a child um, and that he did display symptoms of uh, gigantism uh, fairly early in life. Um, he Basically, um, the root of that being, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, I've got the, the note here somewhere. I'm trying to find the, uh, the actual term for it. Uh, acromegaly, I believe, is the, the, the proper term. Acromegalia or something like that? I, I believe that's, yeah. Mm, acromegalia, that, that sounds a lot, <laughs> a lot more uh, medically accurate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, what that is, is it's a, it's a pituitary gland disorder that um, uh, increases, I guess, hormones, like growth hormones yes. in the body. Um, mm-hmm. So you just continuously grow. Um, that And that's actually um, something that... Uh, Big Show had to be treated for not that long ago. Uh, he still had that, and he had a surgery to have that, I, I believe, removed or corrected. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, there is a corrective surgery for that that they that they actually discovered early on because I believe Big Show got it in the nineties, mm. and um, Andre was kind of against that surgery because he thought that it would ruin his mystique. Mm. Um. Mm-hmm. I guess he thought that maybe, like he, maybe he didn't expect to be around as long as he was, and he thought that you know he'll be around as long as he is, and he will keep the mystique of being that giant. But at the same time, when Big Show got the surgery, he was mid twenties, and he always looked giant, mm-hmm. no matter what. Mm-hmm. I mean, at certain points, obviously he got bulkier, but mm-hmm. Andre, I think if Andre would have gotten the surgery, and obviously we'll talk about this later on, he probably would have lived a lot longer than he actually did. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that that's, uh, that's definite for sure. Um, so he, he, I believe he, he quit school around the age of 14 to begin working. Um, uh, he, I believe, mostly manual labor. On on the on uh, his family's farm, uh, he did some apprenticing as a, as a woodworker. Um, you know, I mean, he was obviously a very big kid from what from yeah. what I'm understanding. So yeah, th- those kind of things make sense. Um, but he he moved to Paris at the age of 18 uh, and uh, began training as a professional wrestler uh, uh, from a from a local promoter. Who obviously recognized how <laughs> big Andre was, um, and and he started competing, um, you know, in France and then and then the UK. Um, he would also make his debut in Japan in 1970, uh, uh, being billed as Monster Rusimov. Uh, um, so he would be wrestling as both a, a singles competitor as well as a tag team wrestler uh, at that time. And uh, in Japan, of course, he's also very well uh, remarked and famed as he is here in the States. Uh, I mean, they he, he has a lot of the same um, 
uh, I guess the memories of Andre are cherished very much the same in, in both countries, from my understanding. Oh yeah, I mean he's a I I I think even you know going back, you could say that he is he was probably the first or mm-hmm. one of, one of the first like worldwide known wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Like if you you knew even if you didn't know about wrestling in that time, obviously way before. Way before our time, but mm. if you knew about him, or you knew anything, if you knew nothing about wrestling, you still knew who Andre the Giant was. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, he was just like a a widely reported character, like I, I, I like he's a cult- cultural icon of that time, right? I mean, well, yeah, before... and you'll hear you'll hear stories, and you know, like the documentaries and everything, and everybody will say the same thing, like, oh, there was this giant man seven foot three whatever he was at this at this wrestling event and i've never seen anybody his size move the way he could like mm. that was that was the mystique of him especially early on in his career in the 70s mm. <laughs> um he he did move of course to montreal uh, canada in uh, 1971 and um uh, had a lot of success but a lot of the same kind of problems were were cropping up at the time um a lot of promoters in europe canada japan uh, they would run out of opponents for andre to face because you know his you know uh, i guess they in their minds they thought there was only so much that you could do or so many people that you could put against a giant that would be like a billable card you know what Mm -hmm. i mean yeah, and that's kind of why he was, uh, even when when he was under contract later on in life, still going to other promotions. Mm-hmm. Because they also didn't want to ruin the mystique of him by having him be, uh, essentially beat everybody and then having nobody for him to face when he came back. Mm. Um, and this is around the time also when um, Andre's relationship actually began with the then WWF with uh, Vince McMahon senior mm-hmm. um, who I, I guess through some by channels, some byway channels um, they were able to, you know, kind of help book and promote Andre in a particular way. Um, Andre for his size at the time was actually quite agile. Uh, yeah. you, you might be able to see some old clips of him doing, Drop kicks, for example, which is something that you would, I mean, I think I've only seen the big show do a handful of drop kicks in, in, in my life. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, McMahon Sr., I guess, wanted Andre, uh, from my understanding, to do more um, strength based moves, moves that you would associate a giant with. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, um, you know, he, he definitely helped, I guess, guide. Andre's career from that point going forward and it also made it a little bit more difficult hand in hand for other promoters because they would have to promote Andre or, or guarantee Andre rather uh, his pay the going rate for him as well as um, a, a booking fee uh, for, for for Vince McMahon yeah. <laughs> Vince McMahon senior rather yeah. um, and so. I think also it this was, I think, also, like, the early stages of, like, tropes in wrestling. Because, mm. like, like you said, like, they, you, you want to book Andre as this immovable, immovable object, essentially, as he was billed mm. later. And, like, having a guy like him do drop kicks and stuff, I, I think he really only did in Japan. Because in Japan, they didn't have those kind of guidelines. Like... They're just like do whatever you you know do whatever, mm-hmm. but in WWF or WWF, essentially, and in later years, it would always be like you're a giant. I don't want to see you selling for this person. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see you take. I don't want to see you take this move, or you know. And obviously, that became a thing, a big thing in the '90s with with Big Show mm-hmm. because. In his early career, he was selling for everybody. And Hulk Hogan was like, what are you doing? (laughs) Like, you're not supposed to do that. 
Like, so yeah, that I think Andre, more like Andre, brother. Yeah, <laughs> and, Andre set the, you know, kind of set it in stone, I guess, for how giants are supposed to work. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so Andre in about 1973 made his debut for WWF. And this actually began the famed undefeated run of Andre, right? He, he would work in WWF, uh, WWF. He would work in other promotions. He would still go to Japan. Um, but all the while, he was not only just like, you know, uh, the, the biggest baby face in, in the company, uh, but for a large part of it, he was just literally unbeatable, right? Yeah. Um, there, there are famous stories of um, him with Hogan very early on, well before the WrestleMania three match, where yeah. the roles were reversed. Andre was the baby face, and Hogan's the the brash heel, you know, yep. the up and comer. Mm-hmm. And that's the, I mean, that's another another WWE trope, you know, writing their own history. Like, oh, this is the first time this has ever happened when <laughs> everybody who was a wrestling fan of that time probably mm. knew of them wrestling at Shea Stadium in, I think, like, late 70s. Mm. Or I think it was, it might have been like 80, 81 or something. But it was like, that was, that was a well-known match. Mm-hmm. And, you know, WWE likes to write their own history. Like, and I'm sure that, I mean, maybe we're not aware of, <clears throat> uh, they said Andre was undefeated for 15 plus years or whatever, but I'm sure that there is recorded losses in there somewhere that they are just ignoring. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm sure. And I mean, you know, there's instances, you know, in Japan and in Mexico, I'm sure as well, where maybe he, he had a loss uh, yeah. somewhere in, in the 70s or 80s. Yeah. Um, one one interesting uh, thing of note here: uh, Andre did compete actually in the uh, card uh, where Muhammad Ali faced Antonio Inoki. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, that's been covered, um, you know, that that extensively. Uh, Antonio Inoki and Muhammad Ali. That's kind of been like the. Um, the the focal point, the epicenter, maybe the starting, the jumping off point of MMA's launch um, uh-huh. because it's, uh, because it's two uh, disciplines, I, I guess you would say, wrestling and boxing. Yeah. Um, but Andre the Giant was actually also on that card uh, facing a a professional boxer, uh, and he actually picked up the win. I believe the boxer's name was Chuck Wepner. Mm-hmm. Um, he he um, he threw Wepner actually over the top rope and uh, won via countout. Uh, <laughs> so you might be able yeah. to find some footage out there on the web somewhere. And I believe there was like right, like literally, like either right before or right after that happened, there was like a showdown between Muhammad Ali and Andre the Giant in the ring, mm-hmm. but not during a match or something. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I, maybe I'm thinking of Gorilla Monsoon. Probably, yeah. I think I think I'm thinking of Gorilla Monsoon, but I think there might have probably been plans for Muhammad Ali to do something in WWF or WWWF, mm-hmm. and I think that they were unable to uh, get that to work out mm-hmm. uh, uh, for obvious reasons, um, and that's why the Inoki match happened. Mm. Um. It, this may be from, so I'm looking at a photo actually now that you've brought that up, and, and this is actually a, quite a famous photo of um, this, and again, I'm not sure what the origin is. It could have been from that 1976 card or promotional material, whatever it might be. Um, uh, but uh, there is a, a very famous photo of Andre uh, in you know, uh, in, in a nice, uh, you know, it uh, looks like a suit jacket of some sort, <laughs> a suit uh-huh. jacket, uh, standing with Muhammad Ali. Um, and Andre has his hand fully opened and Muhammad Ali's comparing his hand size, putting his hand up against Andre's. And he's yeah. just remarking, you know, at, at yeah. the, the size of Andre's hand. 
<laughs> just because it's just so massive. Um, let, let's let's get a, a few other fun facts here about Andre, uh, the the giant and his uh his, his size here. Um, so Andre famously had a uh, size twenty two shoe, uh, which is enormous. Yep. It's a, it's a big shoe. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, even I, I don't even think I did. Shaq beat that. Shaq might have beat that. Shaq, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, foot size. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, well, let's uh, let's let's check this out. Shaquille O'Neal shoe shot uh, shoe size. Yes, Shaquille O'Neal has a size twenty three shoe. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I I knew it, obviously it was close. Mm-hmm. But... Yeah, I was I was thinking about that earlier, actually, thinking about this. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, is that right? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing between 22 and 23. So, I mean, it, yeah, it, it, it was close. I mean, you you always hear like them. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, just like how they kind of uh, over, uh, you know, they they tell you the a build weight and an actual weight. I think sometimes they probably mm. do the same thing with shoe size. Perhaps um, so. <laughs> I mean, cause didn't for a while they say like that big show is like a 23 triple E or something or something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, there is also a very famous photo of uh, Andre the giant. Um, I think this was from sports illustrated. Uh, where, you know, uh, again, hand comparison size. Um, I mean, if you've ever held a, a 12 ounce can of Coke or a 12 ounce can of beer, or whatever it might be, yeah. um, uh, you know, you can have a relative uh, size comparison there. There's a very famous photo of him holding a 12 ounce can of beer in his hand, and it looks like one of those those mini cans that you can buy at the store. Um so I mean, find find that picture as well, folks, when you get the chance. Um, Andre, obviously, his size um, made him very popular, and it helped make him a lot of money. Uh, but it also made his life pretty difficult too. Um, he's he's famed as as saying that uh, they don't build anything uh, for for a giant, uh, which I mean, yeah, that makes makes perfect sense. Um, there's, uh, stories about how he needed to travel with a pencil in order to dial a telephone and make phone calls to people. Um, mm-hmm. he, he did regularly travel. Um, but if he was on an airplane, he could not use the lavatory. He instead had to, you know, have a, a, a bucket, uh, with yeah. him. Um, which I mean, that's obviously got to be embarrassing. Uh, yeah, they, they would put like giant curtains, like, they would bring curtains on the on the flights and like put them around him, mm-hmm. so that obviously they didn't like have to see it happening. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> which is important. I yeah. think that's very important. Um, but yeah, like a lot of that stuff, and like you've seen like the documentaries and everything, and like like at his house, like he had like this chair that mm. was like four times the size of any chair you've ever seen ever more more like, reminiscent of a couch or a love yeah. seat perhaps yeah but it but it was a chair it yeah. was like it that it was it was for him and him alone like stuff like that like and he dealt, obviously dealt with that his entire life and mm. um yeah it, it was not a fun time i guess for him mm-hmm. um he he's also very famous for um uh, his, his, um, how, how do I try and put this politely? Uh, his, his drinking exploits his, mm-hmm. his, his, you know, he, um, he could definitely handle his booze. Uh, there are numerous uh, stories and accounts of him drinking well over a hundred big, a uh, hundred, uh, bottles or cans of beer in, in a sitting, uh, 20 bottles of wine in one sitting. Yep. Um, uh, there was a, um, uh, uh, there's a couple famous stories involving that where uh, on the set of Princess Bride, uh, where he, 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 he is, of course, uh, was was starring in the Princess Bride, he he drank 
to the extent where he had, may have accidentally fell on somebody uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> during during filming, um, but also that um, uh, one, one famous uh, urban we'll call it an urban legend because I've I've heard this countless times. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's verified this um, to the full extent, at least medically. Uh, but uh, when he was having, I believe it may have been a spinal surgery late in his career, uh, that uh, they used his alcohol tolerance as a metric for how they should give him his anesthesia. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's accurate. I think that might have been uh, confirmed on... Mm. Bruce, Bruce Pritchard's podcast. I could mm. be wrong, uh, but yeah, I, I do remember hearing that. Wow, that's that's pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah. He it, it's a uh, he lived quite a life. Um, obviously, he yeah. he had to take take a lot of the good with the bad um, because of his size. Obviously, there's a lot of people who'd want to take advantage of who he was and his fame and this, that, and the other. Yeah, and that also, like, played into, like, he was not really friends with any of the other wrestlers who were considered giants. Mm -hmm. Uh, He famously, like, hated Big John Studd, and Big John Studd was afraid of him. Um, (laughs) And, like... Any other giant that really came through, like, but he also, like, there was other wrestlers, like, that weren't even giants that he just, I guess, didn't, wasn't a fan of. He never liked uh, Randy Savage for some reason. Mm. Um, I don't know why, and I think that also, like, a lot of that played into, like, whether he was going to do certain things in the ring and stuff like that, and, um... But yeah, like he obviously didn't, he had his, like everybody does, had his tight knit of friends, I guess, and didn't care to make newer ones, Mm. (laughs) especially with people who were also considered giants. Mm -hmm. He he did have, he did have some friends. Um, I do, I do recall a, um, um, what was it? it was, I think it was a Joe Rogan podcast where Jake the Snake Roberts actually was the guest mm-hmm. on that particular episode, and he was talking about how he used to be Andre the Giant's chauffeur uh, at, at at one time, yeah. uh, which is uh, crazy to believe. Um, so there there were definitely people that Andre trusted, but it, that was a very small, tight knit circle for him. Right? Oh yeah, like like referee uh, Tim White was his handler for. Mm. At, for like ever mm-hmm. and um a lot of times he was kind of the guy that was like second andre was almost kind of like a godfather in in wrestling like because a lot of times like people he just didn't want to deal with certain people i think and he would kind of just have other people do it for him mm. like like tim white uh who uh has said a lot of th- you know done a lot of interviews about that stuff and talks about how he had a blast with Andre and yeah um I don't think he was a a big fan of of Hulk Hogan either mm. to an extent but I think they became friends later mm-hmm. but yeah there were there was a bunch of stories like that well and that kind of gets to and I know it, you know, everybody that we're going to be kind of skipping around a lot here uh, yeah. on Andre's career, uh, just because there's just so much to cover. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's some bigger things than others, but yeah. Right. Um, WrestleMania one, obviously being one of those things that we can jump right into. Um, they did have um, a, a big match held between the uh, Andre, the giant and um, big John stud. Uh, yeah. Where it was a uh, a body slam challenge, uh, the winner yep. got fifteen thousand uh, dollars in in mm-hmm. prizes. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Andre the Giant slammed Big John Stud at WrestleMania one, won that cash prize. And uh, obviously, they were building that as like, oh, nobody's ever slammed Big John Stud before, but mm-hmm. but on TV, I'm sure it had happened before, but on TV, nobody had ever slammed Andre either. Mm-hmm. So at the time 
Um, so, but yeah, and that also, like, as I was saying earlier, kind of played into their their backstage, uh, quote unquote, uh, friendship, if you could even call it that, because yeah. Andre was not a fan. It <laughs> um, in. Uh, later, uh, um, I guess later on throughout 19, I think this would be about 1985. Um, you know, there is a pretty famous picture of a tag team match that happened at Madison Square Garden of Andre. He's in the ring uh, with uh, Big John Studd and King Kong Bundy with mm-hmm. uh, his tag team partner being Hillbilly Jim. Uh, so that's uh, four very large men uh, in one that's... ring at, at a time. <laughs> That's got to be close to two thousand pounds in one ring. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a that's a ton of wrestler uh, in, yeah. a, in a literal sense. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty pretty up there. Um, WrestleMania two, uh, Andre uh, was part of a, I, I believe it was like um, it was an NFL slash wrestlers cross battle royal. Hmm. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I, I believe he won. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. He, uh, no, he, uh, I think well, didn't William Perry win that one? Uh, so I'm looking at it here. Andre uh, eliminated Bret Hart to win the WWF versus NFL Battle Royal. Oh, uh, okay. I could have so, sworn Will, William Perry was the winner. Hmm. Maybe he uh, just had a strong performance. Yeah, maybe he just looked really good. You know, yeah. I mean, he, he talk about a guy who would really work well in WWF at the time. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, they put him in the Hall of Fame, so. <laughs> yeah, there you go the fridge yeah. um <laughs> uh let's see now around uh 1985 uh 1986 rather he was also filming the princess bride which is another big part of andre's legacy princess bride being one of the most adored movies um uh, out there if you were growing up you know in the you know late 80 mid to late 80s early 90s it's it's a classic um andre has a big part in the movie uh so if you haven't checked it out andre's in it it's pretty great so you know make sure yeah and there's um i mean again like going back the the hbo documentary that came out uh like Hmm. three years ago Mm -hmm. they they did some interviews with uh rob reiner who was the director um robin wright was you know, the princess in that movie and everything. And they talked about how around this time is when things for him, like mobility and stuff, really was becoming an issue. Um, Because there's that famous scene in the movie where he catches Robin Wright, Mm -hmm. you know, in his arms. And they had to use a harness um, because they were afraid that he was going to like fall down or something because of how much he was having trouble, like standing up and stuff. Mm. So they actually used a harness and made it look like she was thrown into his arms and she was really just lowered into his arms. Mm. Yeah. I mean, well, if, and if you look at pictures of him at the time, like he, he had put on a lot of weight. He was very, very big. He'd been carrying around a lot of weight for a long time. Yeah. Um he's obviously much bigger than most people. Yeah. He he had the, the the acromegaly, right? Yeah. Um and it, as a pro wrestler, you're you're bumping and taking moves and getting knocked around all the time. Um I mean, it's that's a rough life that that you put all into one place and he was already getting uh, a, a little bit past his 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 prime. You know, at, at you know, as of the the time of shooting a, a Princess Bride, um, so yeah, it must have been extremely difficult for him, uh, having to having to go through all of that. Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely like the beginning of, uh, him having a hard time. All the time. Yeah. All yeah. the time. This brings us to the famed uh, rivalry buildup. You know the 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 thing that WWE slash WWF has built nearly all of its legacy on, and that is the feud at WrestleMania three 
Andre the Giant, and Hulk Hogan, arguably the two biggest stars in wrestling of all time at the time. Um, basically what happened is uh, Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan both were friends, friendly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they, they appeared on an episode of Piper's Pit. Hogan was presented a very large trophy for being uh, WWF world champion for three years. Yep. And uh, as Andre the Giant, um, you know, congratulated him, uh, Piper also awarded Andre a um, a smaller trophy um, for <laughs> for for being the only undefeated wrestler in wrestling history, which um, again, as we noted, may or may not necessarily be entirely true, um, but. Uh, I, at least they were saying that he had never had a pinfall or submission victory counted or a pinfall or submission loss uh, against him in a WWF ring. Um, yeah. Hogan was congratulating him and Andre, uh, obviously seeing this smaller uh, trophy, um, it, which could be a metaphor for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, he, he, he um, ripped Hogan's shirt and um, he challenged him uh, to a match at uh, WrestleMania three. And uh, if you can go back and check out that segment, it's it's actually a lot of fun. It's very eighties. But not only a- that, there's a small detail that actually wasn't even supposed to happen, but it actually helped oh. help the story. Go right uh, ahead. He also ripped the cross off of Hogan's. Neck. Oh yes, he was wearing a wearing a gold cross like he does all the time. <laughs> and he and he ripped that too, and actually caused Hogan to bleed mm. in the chest because he ripped the the chain, mm. and that wasn't supposed to happen. Added detail that it actually helped tell the story. Well, yeah, because I mean, if you look at it, Hogan is uh, at this time this invincible figure, right? Yeah, uh, you know, oh, he made Hogan bleed slightly. Like that's actually yeah. a pretty big deal. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, Heenan, uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan was with um, uh, Andre here. He was accusing Hogan of, you know, um, n- just being his friend, so he wouldn't have to have the title against him. Um, and yeah. It was just um, it, it was it's just a really great segment. If you can catch it, definitely recommend it. Um, as of the time of WrestleMania three, Andre was probably between being billed at between about five hundred to about five hundred and twenty. Up even I've even read notes of maybe even being upwards of five hundred fifty uh, pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, this is obviously a lot of weight to carry on your person. Um, it just yeah. like, you know, the, the human body's just truly not built, uh, to carry that much weight. Um, but, uh, obviously there's, um, he was in an immense amount of pain. And because of that, there is, um, stories that Hogan has told himself where he was very uneasy the day of the match. Um, you yeah. know, for WrestleMania three, that he wasn't sure if Andre was actually going to put him over, Mike. Yes, uh, and that was also like reiterated in that Andre uh, HBO documentary, um, where they talked about how like Hogan was a nervous wreck throughout the day before and the day of, and Andre was just telling him like, relax, like. Like, and, and, like, not really giving anything away. Like, I'll do the, you, you know, like, and people telling him, like, oh, Andre will do the right thing. Andre will do the right thing. Whatever mm-hmm. the right thing is to Andre. Mm-hmm. That, and that was Hogan's concern. Of course, then the match happens. Right. Um, and obviously, WWF lore is, um, it's, it means a lot to them. They they mm-hmm. take it very very seriously. You even see the the moment in their opening to Raw and SmackDown, um, 
yeah. uh, the, 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 the signature little, the signature package yes thank yeah. you um of hogan slamming andre um the match itself is um it's it's fine it's it's not a good match it's it's it's, it's okay maybe no it's not it, it's it's not a good match. And <laughs> mike from, says it's not a good match okay folks. <laughs> from, from, from a wrestling standpoint and everybody knows this like mm-hmm. It's not a good wrestling match. Mm-hmm. It's it's a spectacle, and that's what it was supposed mm-hmm. to be. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was at the time the the largest crowd ever built upon the biggest match ever, mm-hmm. and it, that was because these two characters, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, figuratively and literally, are the two biggest names in wrestling, mm-hmm. and. Whatever you want to believe, at the time, Andre hadn't lost in 15 years, and he, Hogan was on this giant run from 84 to now, mm-hmm. and it, it this is their quote-unquote first-ever giant meeting, and of course, it's being billed as the biggest spectacle in the history of wrestling. Mm-hmm. But as a wrestling match, it is not good. Yeah, I mean it's it's it it is um it is far more known for the moment. Um yeah. you know, Hogan attempts multiple times in the match to uh slam Andre with I think it's just with with just a standard scoop slam, right? Just pick him up, slam yeah. him. Mm-hmm. Um doesn't work. Andre's not budging. The match continues. And then Hogan eventually hulks up and picks up enough momentum uh, to where he he picks him up uh, clearly and and slams yep. him. He, he he slams Andre. Yep. Uh, runs does the, the the leg drop and gets the three. Um, and history would would be made forever <laughs> uh, after that. Um, he, he this was a this was a big moment, a crowning moment for Hulk Hogan putting uh, being put over here. Andre the Giant. Uh, doing the job and I guess uh, giving the um, uh, giving the, the the star you know McMahon's new star the rub on the way out. Um, Hogan would uh, Hogan would obviously retain the title here, and Andre uh, he would continue to be in WWF. Um, you know, going forward, I mean, he would have he would actually win the title. Um, mm-hmm. Later on, he would sell it to Ted DiBiase, and that's kind of where we got the WrestleMania Four uh, yeah. tournament and challenge. The, mm-hmm. the the way they got to that whole thing was actually a very good story because they did the whole like twin referee thing, imposter mm-hmm. referee thing. Because at the time, I mean, the the Hebners were you know referees for a long time, and nobody knew that Dave Hebner, who was the first Hebner to be a referee. Mm -hmm. uh had a twin brother so they used that in an angle and that's kind of how earl got into the business Mm -hmm. um and that was that was a good storyline for the time obviously again us being from the 90s we weren't there obviously we've seen it enough times to know about it and um that storyline kind of uh springboarded the million dollar man uh rise <laughs> to an extent um yeah uh despite him not being recognized as a champion um but yeah that that's that was actually a really good storyline that led to a lackluster tournament <laughs> mm-hmm. which also began the build of Macho Man Randy Savage oh for sure um and and Macho Man would ultimately win that title at WrestleMania four. Yes, um, because Hogan and Andre would face each other again and have a a double disqualification. So, in, yeah, in, in that tournament, <laughs> crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, um, Andre uh, would also compete at WrestleMania. Uh, Five, um, 
uh, which would be all, obviously the the big feud being the Mega Powers feud at the time between Hogan and Savage. Yes. Um, but um, there was also a a big feud with Jake the Snake Roberts and uh, Andre the Giant, uh, with <laughs> a, it, it being focused on Andre's fear of snakes. Um, that was, that yes. was a big thing. Um, and this also leading to the famous Andre the Giant eliminating himself in the Royal Rumble. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, fun facts about that, um, that is recognized as an official elimination in the Royal Rumble. He eliminated himself. But uh, a couple of years later, Randy Savage would accidentally eliminate himself, and that mm-hmm. would not count because it wasn't part of the story. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I think he just didn't... He, I, I remember is like hearing, like, oh, he just didn't know the rules... Or like he was just like in the moment yeah. and just did it, and yeah, yeah it's just a, a big thing. Yeah, um, that Russell... was just a fun fact. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> we're 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 all about the fun facts here uh, on on Headlock Talk. Um, Andre would have da, 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 uh, another match at WrestleMania six, um, where as part of the colossal connection, him and Haku uh, would lose. Uh, the WWF tag team titles to demolition. Yes. Um, and, and I believe that was kind of like his last, like really big thing that he did in WWF. Mm-hmm. At the time. Um, he would have sporadic appearances uh, yeah. going forward. There would be um, uh, like, I think there was a, um, he, I think he there was an appearance at WrestleMania seven. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. he, he made a single appearance for the UWF, um, which was a was was the Herb Abrams uh, Federation. Yes, a he, one-off appearance. Mm-hmm. Yes, a one-off appearance, and that was uh, fueled for WWE to bring him back, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then I believe he was promoted to be in the Royal Rumble that year, but he was mm-hmm. unable to uh, compete. And, um, yeah, he the 91 Rumble, I believe, he was supposed to appear in the match, but he was unable to, to work mm. because of his health. Um, he, he made... I, like you said, some some appearances. He was on uh, WCW's Clash of Champ uh, Clash of Champions twenty yes. um, in 1992, where he had a, a brief interview. He would also wrestle in All Japan and Universal Wrestling Association. So he had like a, a little uh, excursion to Japan. Um, his last ever match was him teaming with Giant Baba uh, against Rusher Kimura and. Uh, I, I'm going to struggle with this name. Um, so it's Giant Baba and Rusher Kim- Kimura to defeat uh, Haruka Egan uh, Masano- Masanobu, Masan- Masanobu uh, Fuki <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Mo- Motushi, Motoshi Okuma. There you go. I struggled with that one. I'm so <laughs> sorry. So sorry. Um, but yeah, that was his last ever match. Um, again, December 4th, 1992. You can see clips of it online. It's definitely mm-hmm. available. Yep. Um, but yeah, um, that kind of summed up Andre's career. Um, he he had a ranch that he would go to um, out in, I believe it was North Carolina, um, that uh, would be tended to when he was not there. Um, he obviously spent time between there and in France. Um uh, but uh, from from all that I've been uh, aware of during researching this, he he really loved being there on his ranch where he felt really free, uh, where people didn't really judge him. You know, it was just nice and secluded for him. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think he wanted. I think he knew. He he knew that the end was coming. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean this uh, this and like the fir- the the prior years 90 91 92 was really like the roughest years for him as far as like moving around and 
I believe he did use a wheelchair a lot during this time. Um, and yeah, he was definitely not the not the Andre that people were accustomed to in say mm -hmm. early eighties, late seventies in the, in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. And that would ultimately, you know, 1993, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. 1993 um, would, would, I guess, see the end of Andre the giant. Andre the giant did pass away in January 27th of 1993 uh, from congestive heart failure. He was, uh, he actually passed away in a hotel in Paris uh, where he was discovered uh, the next morning. Um, he was also actually in Paris to attend his father's funeral as well. Um, so uh, he spent the day with his, the, his final days with his family, uh, playing card games uh, with some of his, his oldest friends. And um, he wanted to make sure uh, that um, I guess that his, his, maybe in an odd way that his 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 best days were or were his final days were were his his best days with his family and his his close friends yeah. um he was cremated according to his uh, his will and testament and his ashes were scattered at his ranch in north carolina um he his uh, uh entire estate uh was left to a sole beneficiary um his his only daughter robin uh so you know that's uh uh, that was, um, yeah, that's, that's Andre the giant, Mike, that's Andre yeah. the giant. Um, I guess, obviously there are things that Andre is going to be best known for, um, in the future and, and just uh, of all time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but I mean, what, what does, what does Andre mean to you? And, and, and I guess what is, what is Andre's legacy to wrestling for you? Uh, well, as I mentioned at the top, um, he is, I believe, the quintessential giant in wrestling. There is no Big Show. There is no Braun Strowman. There is no, to an, to an extent, Undertaker, Kane, without Andre the Giant. The, he is the reason why big men have a, have a place in wrestling. And he really was the eighth wonder of the world. Mm. I that should I I believe that that was just a given title, but it should have been an official title. Mm. I mean, for sure. I mean, there's so many records that he had in wrestling. Like, uh, what one obscure little fact in 1974, he was actually in the Guinness Book of World Records as being the highest paid professional wrestler. Um, I, um, so, um, th there is that. I'm sure that he held that record for for many years. Um, oh, that's definitely changed today. Yeah, one hundred percent. So yeah, uh, that that is that is Andre's story. Um, we appreciate you guys for tuning in and 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 giving this a listen. Uh, I hope that we did Andre's legacy some justice here, and that maybe this 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 show will will give you uh, some kind of sense of uh, nostalgia to go and check out some of his uh, matches and and career highlights. Uh, I I gotta obviously thank Mike for for coming on and doing uh the 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 guest uh spot work here today and and being my guest host. Uh, Mike, where can people out there find more of your content on the internet? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at mikejc a two one, primarily talking about wrestling. Um, and also on uh, sltdwrestling dot com. Uh, every well, supposed to be Wednesdays, but most recently it's been Fridays, and this week it'll be a Saturday, mm. covering AEW Dynamite, where I do the weekly uh, reviews for that show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also have my own website, MikeJCOnWrestling.com, where, you guessed it, I talk about wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I haven't been as active on there as I would like, Uh I gotta start doing more, uh, more personal write-ups of things. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna start doing more things on there. Okay, well, cool. Soon. Yeah. Well, 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 this episode's coming out in the future, so everybody be on the lookout for Mike's show uh, coming up very soon. 
uh, you know, whatever you have in store. Well, I mean, I I don't know if it'll be podcast related or just more writing stuff. But either way, I would like to do a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) There you go, man. I'm sure you've got tons of people out there who would love to to, to get in podcast with you. Um, like I said, I'm glad that you were able to come on the show because you've been a big part of what Headlock Talk uh, has been. And I really appreciate you for coming in and doing these shows. Obviously, Mike's going to have a lot more episodes here on this uh, little little mini run here as we go um, that, that you'll be able to check out more, more content with Mike um, and, and myself. Uh, if you're out there or listening to this podcast on Love Wrestling, we appreciate you for tuning in and uh, make sure to uh, subscribe to Love Wrestling. Uh, the guys over there are absolutely brilliant, and uh, I really appreciate them for uh, giving me this opportunity to present uh, this last little run of Headlock Talk on their channel. Uh, this episode is obviously also available on my Headlock Talk channel, so you, wherever you're, you're listening to this, uh, make sure to um, subscribe like the episode tell your friends about headlock talk and and love wrestling and where you can find this episode uh i am of course the texas woman tanner fruit and for mike charlotte y'all take care out there be safe and we'll see you again on the next episode bye-bye